A NAS or network attached storage can be incredibly helpful to have in your home, but can also wreak havoc on your bank account if you're on a tight budget. I love to work with older budget hardware, so naturally I set out to build my own NAS using almost entirely used components and true NAS scale. Will it perform well? And if so, will it be any cheaper than just buying something off of a store shelf? Well, let's find out. So why am I even building this NAS in the first place? Really, it's because I need one. I have a small two-bay Synology that I use for some personal stuff, but I really need a good place to store all of the footage and content for this channel, and I'd like it to also be fast enough that I could even edit off of it over the network. I also thought it would just be a lot of fun to see what I could build with deals I found on Facebook Marketplace, eBay, and so on. So let's go ahead and take a look at what I managed to get. First up, we have the case. Now, this might not look like something you would expect from a NAS. One of the benefits of a dedicated NAS from someone like Synology or Asus Store is that they are typically really compact. This old Antec case I found on Facebook for 20 bucks is the opposite of compact. But I really wanted to find a case with a lot of drive bays, and there aren't a lot of affordable options for smaller or newer cases that fit that description. So this Antec should be perfect for this video and also have plenty of room for upgrades and more drives down the road. It also came with four fans, however only three of them actually worked and we're only going to keep two of them, but I'll talk about that later. The motherboard in this case is probably pretty familiar if you've watched some of my other videos, as this is the HP motherboard that I was able to fix thanks to the help from you guys. This motherboard originally came from an HP 200 G1 desktop and features a 4-core Intel J29 CPU clocked at 2.41 GHz, which is unfortunately soldered to the motherboard, but should still give us really good power efficiency and relatively good performance for its age. We also have 8GB of DDR3L memory, which unfortunately is the maximum capacity that the CPU can work with. I got the motherboard CPU combo as well as the RAM for around $50. To power everything, we're just using this Gigabyte 650 watt power supply that I picked up used for $30. And please, don't comment that this PSU is going to explode. It isn't one of the models from the Gamers Nexus video, and we're going to be way below the point of hitting any overcurrent protection or anything like that anyway. Because the motherboard only has two SATA 2.0 ports, we'll be adding in this PCIe to SATA card that I picked up used for $27. I could have picked up a cheaper card with only two ports, but I'd like to have a little bit more flexibility with four. Unfortunately, the PCIe slots on our motherboard are limited to PCIe 2.0 by one, so there probably isn't enough bandwidth to run all four drives, but we should be fine with up to three. I also got a PCIe to 2.5 gigabit NIC for $15 so that we won't be limited by our network connection. I don't have a multi gigabit switch, so we'll still be using the one gigabit port for our network and then have a direct connection to my editing PC using the two and a half gigabit NIC. Now, what about storage? Well, I probably would have looked into getting some used enterprise drives for this build to keep costs down, but the folks over at Asus Store were incredibly generous and sent over four Seagate IronWolf four terabyte drives, as well as their drive store for NAS that I'll be taking a look at here soon. I'm actually going to compare that NAS to the one we built here in this video, which I think is going to be a lot of fun, so make sure to get subscribed. The last thing we need is a boot drive, and I kind of messed up here. I'm going to blame it on lack of sleep thanks to our newborn child, but I got things mixed up while also working on my previous Unraid video. With Unraid, it's 100% recommended to use a single USB stick as the boot drive, which is what I filmed when making this video. However, TrueNAS, which is the OS we'll be using, does not recommend doing that. So for the sake of keeping this video simple and on a budget, I'm still going to use a single USB drive to run TrueNAS, but I wouldn't recommend that for you, and I'd recommend either installing it on a small SSD or using two USB sticks and a mirrored configuration for a bit of redundancy. With all of our parts ready to go, I think we can start putting this all together. 
The only component in this build that really needs to be cleaned up is the case, so I went ahead and removed all the fans, including this broken one on the back, as well as the 140mm fan on top that I'm probably not going to use because it seems a little bit cheap. You can also start to see how dirty this case really is, especially when I get this front panel off. With the case mostly pulled apart, I went ahead and took it outside and used an air compressor and a brush to go ahead and get all the dust off. Then I followed that up with a rag and some isopropyl alcohol to go ahead and really get it cleaned up. I could have done a better job cleaning this up, but I think it's fine and I was really excited to go ahead and get all the components put together. With the case cleaned up, we can go ahead and put in our motherboard and I.O. shield, but these little black rubber pieces that were in the original PC kind of got in the way, so I had to rip those off. With those removed, the motherboard could go ahead and slide into place, and I could go ahead and put the rest of the screws in. After that, we could go ahead and drop in our 650 watt power supply, and normally I would put four screws here, but the last screw was sort of the wrong size, and so I ended up only doing three, but it shouldn't be an issue. Next was our PCIe to SATA card, which is also really easy to install. You just pop it into the PCIe slot, and then screw in the little retaining screw. Then we could do the exact same thing with our 2.5 gigabit network card. Next came the hard drives. For these, I just went ahead and slid them into some of the open bays and put the two screws in on my side and then went ahead and followed up with the screws on the other side before finally coming back to the original side to make sure they were nice and snug. Even though I've done quite a few of these videos, I still managed to get in the way of a lot of the cable management, but for the most part, I just went ahead and ran the power cables to the motherboard as well as to all of our hard drives and then tried to hide a lot of the extra power cables in the back and bottom of the case. After that, I went ahead and ran all of the SATA cables from our hard drives to our motherboard as well as our PCIe card. And after a little bit of cable tie magic, our NAS is pretty much done, and I don't think it looks half bad. With the hardware all finished, it was time to install TrueNAS Scale. Now, I'm not going to explain how to install and set up TrueNAS Scale in depth in this video, because I pretty much covered that in a recent video you can take a look at here if you're interested. After getting TrueNAS installed on our flash drive, I logged into the web UI and created a pool called Hard Drive Haven, and put all four of our drives into a data VDEV, which I set up in RAID Z, which means we can lose one hard drive and replace it without losing any data. Then, I created a dataset within that pool called HavenShare and set the share type to SMB. Before setting up SMB though, I made a user called Haven and let TrueNAS create a Haven group for that user as well. Then, I could head over to the Shares tab and add our Haven share as an SMB share, as well as start the SMB service. Finally, I added the Haven group to the access control list of our file system so that we could actually access the share with our Haven user login. After getting SMB up and running, I went ahead and went to the data protection tab just to make sure that the scrub tasks were scheduled. And I also set up scheduled smart tests and even set up cloud sync to back up this NAS weekly to Google Drive. SMB is great, but I also want to have iSCSI set up with this system. iSCSI is a network share protocol, but instead of sharing files, it shares block storage. When you connect it with Windows, the operating system basically just sees it as another drive connected locally on your system, and my plan is to use this as a drive I can put all my current projects that I'm editing on. To do that, I set up a Z volume in my hard drive haven pool, gave it 750 gigabytes of storage, and set it as sparse, meaning the volume will essentially expand as more storage is needed. 
Then I went to the iSCSI wizard to set up the share. If you're wanting to do something similar to this, I'd recommend checking out Craft Computing's video on it, which I'll have a link for in the description below. Once the share was all set up, I tried connecting to it using the built-in iSCSI initiator in Windows, but that failed. And that was because I just forgot to start the actual iSCSI service in TrueNAS. After fixing that, we were able to connect the iSCSI target, format the drive using NTFS, and then access it as if it were any other local drive in my system. Pretty cool. So far, everything has worked really well, but I'm not taking advantage of my 2.5 gigabit NIC. To do this, I'm going to directly connect that NIC to a 2.5 gigabit to USB adapter I have on my Windows machine. To get this to work though, you have to do a little bit of tinkering with the IPv4 settings. In Windows, I have this NIC set to an IP address of 169.254.100.2 and a subnet mask of 255.255.0.0. In TrueNAS, <laughs> in TrueNAS, I went to the network tab, found our 2.5 gigabit NIC, and set it to a static IP of 169.254.100.3 and then slash 16 which is the same as having a subnet mask of 255.255.0.0. Now, for some reason, when you deselect DHCP from this NIC, it also deselects DHCP from our gigabit NIC. So I just had to recheck that and then test and confirm those network settings. With our two and a half gigabit connection ready, I reconnected to our iSCSI share and mapped our SMB share using the faster connection. With everything set up, let's see how this not-so-little NAS performs. When transferring around 60 gigabytes worth of video, audio, and other project files to our SMB share, we were getting write speeds of about 150 megabytes per second or so, and over 200 megabytes per second at times while reading those files back. This isn't crazy or anything, but we're at least taking advantage of the extra bandwidth we get with our 2.5 gigabit connection. Because we set up iSCSI, Crystal Diskmark actually sees our iSCSI drive as any other local drive, so I decided to compare that to a 7200RPM 2TB mechanical drive in my system, and our DIY NAS definitely performed quite a bit better, with solid improvements to sequential reads and writes, and massive improvements to random reads and writes. Our iSCSI drive looks a little less impressive when compared to a simple SATA SSD, but with iSCSI and TrueNAS, we have the benefit of capacity as well as redundancy. So there's a really good chance I'm going to actually try out editing off of this iSCSI drive. That way, if there's a drive failure, I shouldn't lose any footage or editing progress. While this NAS may look a little bit big and mean, it really didn't consume much power, pulling 38 watts from the wall at idle and around 45 watts during an extended data transfer. I don't have any data when it comes to noise, but I've had this NAS on my desk for well over a week now, and I don't really notice it all that much. It isn't the quietest thing in the world by any means, but it definitely wouldn't be very noticeable tucked away in a corner or something. Now I know some people are probably already typing comments about what is or could go wrong with this system, and that's probably fair because this isn't perfect by any means. I know someone is going to mention reliability, but if you're trying to run some sort of critical or intense workload off of a $150 DIY server, well, that might be on you. There's always a chance that hardware can fail, and that chance can go up in working with used or older hardware, but realistically, I don't think it's a huge deal for me at least. If this motherboard crashes, I can easily drop in a replacement and get my NAS up and running fairly easily, and that applies to basically all of the components in this build. All right, future me here just for a little bit, and funny story. The four port SATA to PCIe card actually failed on me after about a week and a half of using this NAS, but fortunately I was able to swap it out with a two port SATA card I had lying around, and I was pretty easily able to get my NAS back up and running without losing any data. Just thought I'd mention this. Downtime isn't great, but it's not a massive ordeal for what I do. If that's not the case for you, well then maybe look into something higher end to suit your needs. Another issue with this build is its size. If you're needing your DIY NAS to fit into a tight space, this case is definitely not for you. 
If you're wanting something really compact, you'll need to spend more on some sort of special case, as well as a mini ITX form factor motherboard. Speaking of motherboards, there are quite a few limitations to this one. First of all, we're limited to only 8GB of RAM. While I think this is going to be fine for my use cases, we would probably get better performance with TrueNAS if we could add more memory, as ZFS can really use any extra memory to help with caching. And while the J29 holds its own running TrueNAS, we're probably not going to be running a bunch of containers, services, or virtual machines on it with a ton of success. This motherboard is also somewhat limited on the I.O. side of things, with only two SATA 2.0 ports, two PCI Gen 2 by one slots, and a PCI slot. We could add one more hard drive into our PCIe card, but adding a fourth would probably start to cause a bottleneck on that PCIe bus limiting performance. We could get a PCI to SATA card to add one more hard drive, but at that point, it probably makes more sense just to upgrade the motherboard entirely. Which brings us to one of the first benefits of a system like this. All of the components in this system can easily be swapped out and upgraded. And even better, the old components can still be used elsewhere, because all the parts are fairly standard PC hardware. It's a little ugly, but it performs pretty well, doesn't draw too much power, and was fairly cheap compared to buying something from a manufacturer. The total cost on this was around $150, and most 4-bay NASs you can buy are often more than double that price. If you're curious as to how this might compare to something that's store-bought, make sure to get subscribed because, like I said before, I'll be comparing this NAS to this Asus Store Drive Store 4 really soon, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I also already have plans to upgrade this machine down the road, so stay tuned for that. If you're interested in building something like this for yourself, but TrueNAS isn't your thing, maybe check out my video on converting an older gaming PC into a home server using Unraid. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you so much for watching, stay curious, and I really hope to see you in the next one.